You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 15, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, allergies and asthma in the elderly. Our presenter is Dr. Galen Marshall. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Mississippi School of Medicine in Jackson, Mississippi. to get started. Um, we're, um, I apologize, we're using a new system, Microsoft Teams today, and so there's some, still some kinks I guess we have to work out. But um, we appreciate um, um, Dr. Marshall being patient with us. Um, for our second talk this morning for COLA, we're, um, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Galen Marshall uh, from the University of uh, Mississippi Medical Center. Um, Dr. Marshall has been involved in allergy immunology for a number of years in a lot of different capacities. And um, he has uh, spoken before um, on allergy and asthma in the elderly, and I asked him to do it again because he had such a great talk, and I'm going to let him get started. Thank you, Paul, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, these are my disclosures really just related to research uh, and my editorial responsibilities. What we're going to do today is to talk about the similarities and differences in the incidence, prevalence, pathogenesis, and clinical presentation of asthma in particular, but also other allergic diseases in the elderly versus younger patients. And as you'll see this is that they'll, they, several of these uh, slides I have that I took from the literature talk about elderly versus non-elderly. So I guess you can put yourself wherever you want, but the magic usual cutoff for this is age 65 or greater. And then we're going to discuss the unique challenges in diagnosis and management in these patients, including their comorbidities, drug interactions, socioeconomic concerns, and cognitive decline that can truly impact uh, therapeutic adherence. My guess is that if you're a regular practicing clinician, either in the community or academics, you see this population. I am now personally in this population, and there are clear differences in our approach to diagnosis and management of these folks. Basic facts, just to go over it again, that we all already know, and allergic pathogenesis, production of allergen-specific uh, IgE, mast cell activation with subsequent exposure because of the cross-linking of that antigen-specific IgE, and then the resulting inflammatory response in late phase that when I was uh, going through training, they thought late phase happened in about 25 to 40 percent of the individuals. The numbers now is that it's the unusual person that doesn't have some sort of late phase reaction, and there's some question that this may actually be enhanced as we age. Clinical manifestations, of course, organ-specific or multi-organ in food, drug, uh, anaphylaxis, et cetera. And the therapeutic approach still, even with all the wonderful choices we have, is still avoidance is the primary thing when possible. So there is no better therapy for drug allergy than avoidance if that's possible or unless there's some superseding um, uh, need to give that specific drug to which the patient is allergic. The whole food issue now that we're entering the idea of oral immunotherapy and other things for food allergy is going to be revisited, but at least still currently the recommendation that we have in a food allergic individual is avoidance of that food and then the potential foods that would be cross-reactive with it. A medical therapy which is designed to decrease sensitivity to the mediators and then allergen immunotherapy to decrease sensitivity to the allergens themselves. In the elderly, there's some special considerations that we, that we must consider, first related to the pathophysiology. First of all, there's more varied exposures. As we get older, we've seen more. We've been more places. We've done more. And that relates to environmental differences, changes in the diet. There are things that I can't eat very well now that 20 years ago I ate without any problem at all not necessarily related to an IgE-mediated mechanism, but just because of the fact that my digestion has changed, my activities have changed, my metabolism has changed. All this can have impact in the pathophysiology of allergic sensitivity. Polypharmacy. Uh, again, when I was in internal medicine training at University of Iowa 30-some-odd years ago, 
uh, polypharmacy was something you would list very quickly because it was a real concern where people taking over five medicines. Nationally now, in people over the age of 50, the average number of medications we take is over six. So as we get older, people add more drugs, supplements, herbals, et cetera. Polypharmacy is a very real issue. Immunologically, our immune system changes as we age. The greatest impact for sensitization is on neoantigens as opposed to recall antigens. But as we'll discuss more in a moment, there's a very real effect on the regulatory mechanisms as well. And then secondly, secondary immunosuppression, which can be from comorbid diseases, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, diabetes, et cetera versus uh, actual drug-related need to uh, suppress the immune system because of increased incidence and prevalence of inflammatory disorders as we get older. Clinically, these comorbidities can mask or alter the presentation. Someone who has congestive heart failure can also have asthma, and it's not always easy to tell, particularly they call you at 10 o'clock at night and say, Doc, I can't breathe. Is it because they're in failure or is it because of their asthma? Even the diagnosis of that can sometimes be a challenge. Certainly true in the GI tract, certainly true in the skin as well. Drug-drug interactions may be more complicated, not only because of the fact that they're less well described in older individuals, even in clinical studies that do not exclude older individuals, rarely, unless the study itself is designed to look at older individuals, rarely do they actually go to the effort of recruiting. So you're talking about a small percentage of the total population of, of patients that are looked at in drug approval. So drug-drug interactions that are reported are usually in younger individuals and can be more challenging as we age. Therapeutic approach, again, phenotype of the of the entity becomes important because overlap is more common. Not just true for asthma, COPD, but for allergic, non-allergic rhinitis, for food intolerance, food allergy, adverse drug reaction, drug allergy, these overlaps get more common as people get older. And then the simple fact is, is that as we get older, because we metabolize the drugs differently, because our GI tracts are different, drug intolerance becomes a much more significant problem as the population ages. You talk about pathophysiologic considerations. Here are some of the basic immunology that we know from the literature. T cells as we age, T cells diminish. The CD4, CD8 ratio gets lower. Memory cell numbers in the CD45 population diminish and in the naive cells, CD45 RO actually go up. B cell numbers decrease with age, particularly the CD19 pan B cell marker. And interestingly, NK cells actually increase with age. This is not just a difference in concentration. It's not just an idea that, well, okay, because we have fewer of these cells as the uh, non-granulocyte percentage of our CBC uh, is assessed, the NK numbers just replace a higher number. It's not a, that at all. The actual numbers when quantitated by CD1656 actually do increase with age. Cytokines, there are those that decrease with age, IL-2, goes along with the idea of decreased numbers of T cells. But interestingly, IL-10 and TGF-beta, two of the primary immunoregulatory cytokines, tend to decrease with age. Increase, not surprisingly then, are some that can have both allergic and regular inflammatory uh, uh, functions. IL-4, 6, 1, one receptor antagonist, TNF-alpha, IL-12, and IL-15, all in the appropriate settings can be pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then immunoglobulins, the IgG actually increases uh, with age, GG1 and 3, but not IgG4. IgA goes up. IgM remains stable and IgE decreases. These last two are particularly interesting in the standpoint that one would ask the question, well, yes, these concentrations are so much dependent on total volume and blood volume, so it's just that we get more dehydrated as we get older because more people are on diuretics, and so IgG goes up. If that were true, then all of the uh, immunoglobulins would change accordingly, and IgM does not change, so that argues against the, the explanation that these are false uh, positive increases. They are real increases, the clinical significance of which is not exactly clear. Uh, environmental influences in the elderly, 
global temperatures are associated with an increased incidence of allergic sensitization in the elderly. And that may be for two major reasons. One is related to the increased pollution levels. And interestingly enough, I have been, and I'm thinking many of you have been as well, over in the area around Arizona and, and New Mexico and Nevada, over there where it ought to be gorgeous because there are not that many big cities, and you get up and you look across these, these wonderful plains and in the mountains, and you would think you would see these wonderful, pristine, clear mountains because the nearest city is three or 400 miles away and they're fuzzy, and they're, they're polluted, and you see this. The global pollution is issue, particularly with petrochemical, is not a political issue. You can talk about whether it's a cycle or not, it's normal or not, but the reality is that it is worse. The ozone, PM 2.5s, the other reactive oxygen uh, species are increased in number just about anywhere where you want to measure them, and our sensitivity gets greater with age. Uh, the adverse impact on cardiovascular, pulmonary, mucosal tissue, as well as increasing plasma viscosity, which can be, of course, a problem for us as we get older. And there's also an association with these global temperatures with heightened and prolonged pollen seasons in the more temperate climate. Uh, they, uh, this has been reported on in the literature for the last 20 years, and it's getting to the alarming area where there are parts of the country, literally, where there is no uh, winter anymore, where there was a winter 30 or 40 years ago, and as a result, the, um, the pollen season really never goes away. One is replaced with another. Internally, housing of elderly are often not as clean, and I put that in quotes. My wife, who is almost my age, would be very upset if I suggested she does not keep a clean house. But I will say that, for example, we now have uh, indoor pets. Neither of us are allergic to uh, animal dander. We have indoor pets where when our children were growing up, that didn't happen. They were outdoor. That's more common as people get older because these pets become companions. And it's particularly true in institutional settings where the cleaning of this is done in a more episodic than a continual fashion. Resultingly, increased levels of house dust mite, cockroaches, rodents, pet dander, etc. The clinical spectrum of allergy that's presented in the uh, uh, elderly individual. We'll just kind of go over this, uh, and these slides are available to you if you want to look at them. And this is a summary of the literature. Allergic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis is the most common allergic eye disease in individuals over 65, and it rarely presents without other atopic conditions being present. It can be atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, or an allergic component to asthma. The major differential is senile keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, a bacterial infection, or herpetic. Those last two being particularly dangerous, or herpetic one is considered really a medical emergency and a uh, very is very important for an ophthalmologist to see that patient in an extremely timely fashion. I have seen, but never. Never, I've seen pictures of, I should say, but never really personally seen, fortunately, the impact of someone uh, uh, innocently putting uh, uh, steroid drops in the hands of an individual who had herpetic keratoconjunctivitis to try to help their symptoms, and they come back the next day and have strong uh, uh, corneal ulcers to the part where corneal transplant is oftentimes necessary. So this is major important as they get older to make that sort of differential diagnosis. For rhinitis, history is the key, just like it is for all ages, but it's particularly important for a suspicion to atopic component. When I was growing up, it was believed that when you saw someone over the age of 50, the likelihood of them being uh, allergic was so low that except in extraordinary circumstances, you wouldn't even test them, let alone treat them for allergic disease. It was considered, you, you'd be considered a scratch and shoot doctor if you did something like that. That was just 35 years ago. And now we know that in fact, uh, skin testing or even in vitro testing is often indicated in these individuals for the simple reason that the allergic component 
us baby boomers have brought it into our middle life and now into our senior years, it's by no means zero like we used to think it was 30 years ago. The major differential, of course, is chronic non-allergic rhinitis, vasomotor rhinitis, or rhinitis medicamentosum. And remember that there are other medications, particularly those that deal with the autonomic nervous system, that can create a rhinitis medicamentosum besides Afrin nasal spray. It's certainly capable of doing it, but it's by no means the only culprit. In allergic skin diseases, contact dermatitis is particularly common. Chemicals, fragrance, uh, heavy metals, uh, nickel still the number one, even as we're older. Atopic dermatitis is much less common, but should be considered in new onset eczema in the elderly with, along with allergic contact dermatitis as a differential. Uncommon rashes for, uh, can be from a drug rash, so again, the history becomes important. In scabies, that's why we always ask the question if others are itching in the house, others have a rash at the same time. That's particularly true of institutionalized individuals. Scabies can be a significant problem. Uh, continuing on with chronic urticaria, it's less associated uh, with angioedema and there are fewer urticarial lesions. So finding an individual uh, elderly patient covered head to toe in chronic uh, spontaneous urticaria is distinctly unusual. Uh, physical and cholinergic uh, are less common than the spontaneous uh, component. Infectious is more common in the elderly and you think about couple of uh, infections in particular, H. pylori and uh, Anasacus simplex. 45% of elderly individuals' chronic urticaria is associated with autoimmune, particularly antibodies such as anti-IgE receptor. Uh, aspirin and NSAID sensitivity is greater than uh, in the elderly, and new onset as opposed to recurrent chronic urticaria in the elderly is associated with a monoclonal gammopathy. So when you have a 70-year-old who comes in and they have chronic urticaria, it's been bothering them for greater than eight weeks, and they're not all that responsive to antihistamines or they have the side effects associated with it, at least in your mind you should play with the idea, do I need to check uh, a, uh, a, an immune globulin or at least uh, maybe an SPEP to see if they might have a, a monoclonal uh, gammopathy. Um, keep going. In angioedema, new onset hereditary angioedema is exceedingly rare in elderly individuals. It could be recurrent. It could be they don't remember very well, but new onset, particularly without uh, a family history. So it's almost, uh, if they have a C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency, it's almost certainly acquired. And so a collagen vascular disease neoplasm workup is extremely important in these individuals. There's a higher rate of angioedema in patients taking ACE inhibitors, and I would put in this ARBs as well. The data are fuzzier on ARBs than they are with the ACE inhibitors. So the, uh, when someone comes to you with angioedema, uh, we always think of an ACE inhibitor. If they're taking one, we ask that question. If they're taking one as an elderly individual, we don't wait for their tongue to swell. We don't wait for their throat to swell. If they're having any kind of angioedema, we take them off of it immediately because they're of the higher rate and the higher severity that can be there. Anaphylaxis has no specific increase in incidence with age. It's, however, more likely to be idiopathic or hymenoptera-related. Food anaphylaxis is distinctly unusual in the elderly population. However, morbidity and mortality is considerably higher in the elderly. It's not terribly surprising, but it is something to keep in mind, particularly because uh, in individuals that have cardiovascular or pulmonary uh, comorbidities, uh, if they're taking concomitant meds or polypharmacy, the NSAIDs, aspirin, beta blockers, et cetera, these are things that we as allergists and immunologists have to deal with. We can't pass it off to the primary care doc or someone else if there is a history of anaphylaxis in these elderly patients. Uh, moving along to food allergy, the incidence is increasing worldwide and appears to occur in elderly as well, up to 5% of elderly individuals. Considering maintaining existing food allergy into later life versus a new onset food allergy, the first one is far more common than the second one. It is distinctly uncommon for a 70-year-old to suddenly develop an IgE-mediated sensitivity to shrimp. 
it can occur. We're probably most of us that are a little gray in the temple are completely gray. Uh, have seen this, but it is distinctly unusual compared to someone in their 20s or 30s developing that. The most common pre presentation is GI-related. Anaphylaxis to foods is far less common in elderly. Drug allergy, remember adverse drug reactions are more common, but drug allergy, IgE-mediated, is distinctly less common in the elderly compared to the younger population, yet if they have a IgE-mediated drug allergy, it carries up to a 10% mortality risk. So pursuing that to find out the mechanism becomes particularly important when you're talking about antimicrobials that have large amounts of cross-reactivity with other groups, and you're now beginning to limit the number of uh, uh, available antimicrobials for an individual patient because of their history. It's estimated that the ADR account for much as 10% of geriatric hospitalizations. The risk factor for drug allergy itself, female more than male, clinically frail, the different comorbidities as we've mentioned, and the fact that they are uh, doing polypharmacy. It's not clear if polypharmacy is actually altering drug metabolism in a way which everyone thinks about, but there's not a lot of data to prove because there's so many different potential combinations, or if it's just the idea that if you're exposed to more, then the simple likelihood in a statistical fashion is going to increase if you're exposed to 10 drugs rather than if you're exposed to one. The culprit drugs are not substantially different from younger populations, so there's not a particular kind of drug in older individuals that they're more likely to be allergic to than if it's a younger individual. Therapeutic considerations in terms of efficacy. Remember, antihistamines have a decreased effectiveness. Now, effectiveness can be have a subjective component to it. The elderly are still now, again, my generation and people up to 10 years older than me, I'm in my late 60s, uh, are uh, growing up in the day where Benadryl was a standard antihistamine and non-sedating antihistamines did not come into play until well into our adult life. We were in our mid to late 30s and 40s uh, when uh, uh, the widespread use of non-sedating antihistamines came to play. So some of the idea of the effectiveness of antihistamines has to do with its other problems. Uh, diphenhydramine is a classic example. People will tell you what, how great diphenhydramine is and the others are not because of it drives me up so well. Well, that's probably the anticholinergic effect, not really the antihistaminic effect. But all things being equal, in in vitro studies that have been published in the literature, the binding affinity as an ad, uh, as a as a adverse agonist that you have for the antihistamines is lower for the uh, as we get older. So the receptor affinity seems to change. Certainly the corticosteroids are still the mainstay in controlling inflammation, and catecholamines continue to work for cardiovascular support, although they're not as good at it as they are when it's a young person. The side effects are often related to comorbid morbid end organ dysfunction in the patient, and antihistamine, again, it can be an anticholinergic, so you've got urinary retention, you've got changes in sweating, body temperature, and then the soporific effect of altering their uh, um, sensorium, altering their balance, et cetera. For anyone listening that's PD trained, we will tell you that in medicine, the first year of residency, you're taught that you can reduce advice to uh, patients over the age of 60 to two words, don't fall. And when you have something that increases soporific effects, the potential for that uh, gets to be much stronger. So fortunately, even in the cost considerations, many of the non-sedating antihistamines now are competitively priced with the more traditionally heavily sedating antihistamines and can lead us to give advice to our patients, particularly our elderly patients, not to use diphenhydramine, not to use some of these other first-generation antihistamines that can have a significant effect on their, uh, their soporific status. Corticosteroids, of course, issues related to bone density, diabetes, weight gain, skin thinning, glaucoma, cataracts, etc. Polypharmacy itself is the thing that we've already talked about, and it's its own issue. And then psychosocial, we have to realize, again, that memory impairment can have an impact on therapeutic adherence. 
I don't know about you, but I used to get kind of intolerant when somebody says, well, I'm not sure if I used my medicine or not. And I'd say, come on, did you use it or did you not? Well, now if you're older and you slow down a little bit, and you do, and if you are taking a bunch of different medicines, and many of them are, and you're taking them multiple times a day, and many of them are, then maybe you're now going into more of a reactive mode than you are a uh, uh, a preventive mode and that you forget to use your medicines, uh, particularly if they cost a lot, and you figure out that if instead of using it twice a day, you use it once every other day, you can double or quadruple the life of the medicine and you don't have to pay for it as much. That affordability is not a trivial thing when it relates to the therapies that we offer our patients. Anxiety and depression can affect symptom perception and even therapeutic motivation and realizing this in our patients is something we don't do a very good job of. We don't ask these questions on a regular basis. We don't use forms that would assess that nearly as much as we do, say, the asthma control test or if you happen to use it, the urticarial control test where you can get really good information from the patient in a short period of time. We don't use the same thing where anxiety and depression is concerned, even though no one that does this very long argues the point that it can play a real role in the overall management success of our patients, particularly in the elderly. What about immunotherapy? Again, when I was growing up, the idea was that you were a scratch-and-shoot doctor if you did it, but yet it still shifts type 2 to type 1 dominant immune balance, decreases total and allergen-specific IgE, and may increase IgG4, which could have blocking function. Depends on who you want to talk to as to whether they believe that or not. Historically, again, it was considered a contraindication because the idea was that the symptoms were not IgE-mediated and that our immune system was brittle and would not respond to immunotherapy even if it is IgE-mediated. And the concern, of course, not inappropriately, about the increased mortality risk in elderly from immunotherapy uh, reactions because of either their comorbidities, their specific polypharmacies, et cetera. There is clearly evidence for uh, immunotherapy in the elderly, but it's sparse. But remember, a, a, a negative does not prove, or a, an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's what I was trying to say. So we can't just say because there's not a lot of evidence that uh, the efficacy of immune uh, immunotherapy is not there in the elderly, there's also even less evidence that in trials that it doesn't work. Most of us have patients in our 60s, even 70s. I have one patient in her 80s that is on immunotherapy for a defined period of time, and she has clinically responded. She meets all the criteria as an 81-year-old that she would have met as a 30-year-old for her allergic disease. So moving on. Uh, looking at the epidemiology in asthma uh, between early onset asthma that lasts into later years and later onset asthma, it's the increase in prevalence is similar to younger age groups, about 10%. It is underreported and underdiagnosed oftentimes because of comorbidities that disguise it, but there is a higher morbidity and mortality associated with it. If you look at the early onset compared to late onset, it, early onset is more likely to be atopic. They're likely to be more highly symptomatic, but that is a subjective symptom report. Individuals uh, sort of live with more uh, physical burden as they get older and just consider it part of getting older and being normal. The end result of that is that the morbidity and mortality is higher uh, and it's often confused with COPD even when there's no history of smoking in the individual and even with evidence of reversibility. The uh, asthma COPD overlap is more prevalent in this age group. Remember, COPD overlap is not syndrome anymore. We drop the S. It's just considered asthma COPD overlap. There are two major types. Again, the early onset, which is in that left-hand column, uh, continuing into the senior years, and then new onset after the age of 65. Let me move this forward. Here we go. The pathophysiology, again, from immune senescence. Regulatory and neoantigen deficiency resulting in an inflammatory environment. And in the literature, you'll even find it called inflammaging, which I thought was kind of clever. I didn't make it up, but I did think it was clever. 
The atopic component is much less but not zero. It's about 25% versus 50% in asthma in the younger population, and it's more likely to be perennials rather than seasonals. Dyspnea is the most common presenting symptoms. Half report retrospective breathing difficulty years or even decades before the diagnosis was made. And again, they thought, well, you know, I'm just getting older. Or maybe they had a cardiovascular comorbidity, or maybe they had a pulmonary comorbidity, and they just assumed that that was from that rather than being from asthma itself. Bronchiectasis is not uncommon in the older uh, asthma population, so much so that if there's any uh, issues related to infection or severe asthma or hospitalized individual, something like an HRCT to look for bronchiectasis is certainly clinically appropriate because they'll have it in more severe asthma, more likely to be hospitalized, and in people with chronic respiratory failure. And then high air pollution is associated with ED visits for asthma exacerbations as well. So if you live in a bigger city, Kansas City, I grew up in Houston, Texas, big cities, the 6 o'clock news when in the summertime when they have these temperature inversions will have these respiratory alerts. It's very important, particularly in our older populations, even in those that are well-controlled, to give them the warning to pay attention to this and take appropriate actions, staying out of the environment when it's high, air-conditioned environment, and so on. Uh, look at this uh, little cartoon. I think it's very nice because it shows you the differences in terms of what happens that's due because we're getting older down the left side or versus the actual asthma itself. Getting older, it's a little bit harder to do something about because you're trying to slow down the process, but this happens to everyone. Everyone's alveolar space gets larger. Everyone has a decreased elastic recoil pressure. Everyone has decreased compliance of the chest wall and spine, and everyone develops premature airway closure and the potential for air, air trapping as we get older. If you layer on that the issues related from the asthma itself, in particular as for uh, airway inflammation with the potential for remodeling, it gives you an accounting for the more severe, difficult to manage asthma that we see in these older individuals. Again, looking at the immunopathophysiology of asthma, uh, notice here in terms of innate uh, versus adaptive system, increase in peripheral eosinophilia and uh, hyperreactivity in men in the, found in the Norman Aging Study, decreased de de degranulation of the peripheral eosinophils in older patients with asthma, so they're a bit less active, increased bronchiolovular lavage fluid neutrophils and neutrophil elastase activity in older patients without asthma. So this goes up as we get older. It also goes up in asthma itself. Sputum neutrophils increase in older versus younger patients with the same level of asthma and sputum neutrophil mediators in older patients with asthma like IL-8, MMP9, neutrophil elastase, and others. From an adaptive standpoint, Tregs are decreased in older patients uh, with asthma versus the age-controlled subject. They're also even more in the individual uh, with old asthma compared to young asthma. Uh, it's just more prevalent in the non-asthma age controls. T-cell pro-inflammatory cytokines increase with aging, as we mentioned ago, this so-called inflammaging term that you'll see in the literature. And then from a humoral standpoint, even though IgG goes up, the antibody responses specific to vaccine diminishes with age. It's a part of a natural consequence of aging itself. Diagnosis, the common diagnostic criteria are valid in the elderly. Clinical presentations, again, dyspnea is the number one, cough is number two, and can be more subtle as it's often uh, chronic. And, and the, what you have to consider is continuous symptoms versus a relapse someone had as a child It now develops an older age versus new onset because the pathophysiology may be distinct in each one of these, and they can be considered different phenotypes. There are often comorbidities that confuse it. Again, cardiac asthma and congestive heart failure, diabetes, renal insufficiency that can affect fluid balance and cardiovascular function, 
concomitant smoke exposure, both primary versus secondary, and what, are, what you may be looking at is now that we understand that in some patients with COPD, they can have an eosinophilic variation uh, as well as neutrophilic variations in some patients with asthma, and then this asthma-COPD overlap that exists as well. That becomes important, uh, and I'll, to put a little plug in, we have a very nice review article from Nick Hanania's group at Baylor in Houston talking about the, the current uh, management strategies for asthma COPD overlap for allergists, immunologists. It'll be in the, uh, I believe it's the October issue of the Annals, and I would encourage you to, to, to look out for that because it's a very nice discussion of this very important topic in older individuals. Uh, diagnostic complications that go along with it. There's a typical prejudice to move to COPD even without a strong smoking history. If you're old and you have obstruction, it's COPD. If you're young and you even smoke, it's still asthma. They're not necessarily correct, and we have to purge ourselves of that prejudice before we uh, uh, and consider each patient on their own diagnostic criteria. Just because it's not initially reversible doesn't indicate irreversibility. Again, an 18-year-old kid comes into your office and you check FEV1 and do an albuterol bron bronchodilator response and it's negative and he's got 27% decrease in his FEV1 and his ratio is down about uh, 15%. You give him bronchodilator and nothing really changes. You're not going to assume this kid has COPD. You can give him steroids and bring him back a little bit later, check him again and see if the same thing is true. Is there a permanent obstruction or is there not? We should be willing to do the same thing where our older patients are concerned without a strong uh, smoking history in particular. Uh, mental status, uh, again, higher rates of anxiety and depression occur as we age. This can affect disease perception and perception of the severity of disease itself. This altered symptom uh, perception can relate to chronicity versus inactivity. Uh, we are not masochists by nature. So if there's something we do that makes us feel worse, we simply stop doing it. As we get older, we tend to become more sedentary. It is a natural, it is the relative unusual 70-year-old that goes out and walks five miles a day. They're much more likely to sit at home and watch television or read or not be very active that can subtly have been uh, driven by the fact that when they try to do activities, they get dyspnea enough or they get uh, difficulty, uh, not only in dyspnea, but difficulty in other systems that they just decide that they'll avoid it. By avoiding it, they don't have the problem. Uh, the, that can then result in uh, physical deconditioning that when they do try to get up, they just, uh, they just simply get, they're sort of rolling down the cycle uh, because their physical deconditioning now makes their inactivity more common, and then they can develop interstitial lung disease that can be another reason for the dyspnea that goes along with this. So what about diagnostic workup? History can be inaccurate, a cause of recall bias or their reluctance for candor. You want to do pertinent negatives and positives and good lung exam, but remember the lung exam may appear normal. You may not hear anything but breath sounds. Pulmonary function... Spirometry in the office is always a good start, but in these patients, at some point, a full PFT is important. And we believe it's important sooner rather than later because it helps you with the potential, say, with a DLCO to look for an interstitial component to see if there's air trapping that you're just simply not going to be able to see well with spirometry, but you can see better with uh, full PFTs. So early on, particularly with new diagnosed uh, asthma, in an older individuals, we consider full PFTs uh, very early in their management. Imaging itself, again, CT versus HRCT, the value of HRCT is looking for bronchiectasis. Any structural abnormalities are interstitial processes, per se. Compare, again, now comparing spirometry and these different characteristics on the left in the elderly versus the non-elderly population. Again, spirometry may be less useful in frail patients, just like there's a minimum age that you can uh, have confidence in the results of a uh, spirometry in the office. Uh, there is an, a maximum age, not so much based on the chronology of their age, but their physical condition. If they're frail, if it's difficult for them to stand, and again, the problem is, is that the reference standards, remember, we all lose lung function with age. 
It's a natural consequence of aging, whether you have asthma, whether you have COPD, or whether you have neither. It's the slope of the curve. It's the rate of a loss of this pulmonary function that is greater in those with uh, obstructive lung disease. But the standards are not well widely available in older patients compared to the younger uh, ones because those standards were established in these younger patient populations. The bronchodilator responsiveness tends to be less uh, uh, pronounced, but can't. But and the uh, exhaled nitric oxide may be useful. That's an appropriate one that came from this uh, nice review article that Sklut did a couple of years ago. But uh, there, it, it has the same problems in exhaled nit nitric oxide, has the same problems in the elderly than it does in the younger. And so its value is limited, but it may have some uh, value for individual patients. But the choline challenge is usually uh, uh, less useful for two reasons. Number one is that uh, there can be uh, comorbidities that will make it a relative contraindication. And number two is that there is a nonspecific increase to methacholine sensitivity as we age in non-asthma patients. So its value now becomes more of a, if it's negative, it suggests that they don't have a significant reactive airway disease. Not if it's positive, it tends to prove that they do. ATP is less common, comorbidities, again, we've talked about, and the phenotypes, we're still working on these, but uh, what they use now is late uh, onset asthma, longer standing asthma, and then the overlap uh, that have been described, and those are the three big ones in elderly that are more associated. I think we'll see more as things go far farther, more likely to be neutrophilic in the sputum compared to eosinophilic in the younger populations. Uh, as we go through this diagnostic workup, allergy testing should be considered as the history suggests. Remember, their blood IgE will be lower and their skin will be less responsive. So you may want to readjust what you consider a positive test in allergy skin test. And now that uh, they have lowered a, uh, a positive uh, threshold to 0 0.10 international units as opposed to 0.35 that most of us grew up with, uh, in these individuals, if it matches the history, you may want to pay more attention to that than you would consider to be a false positive someone in their 30s. CBC with diff looking for eosinophils can be useful. Total IgE, if it is elevated, is a significant thing to look for. And then ACT, remember special considerations for the dyspnea, the nighttime awakening. Sometimes you have to go over it with them. Are you waking up because you're, you're having difficulty breathing? Or are you waking up because you have to go to the bathroom? And then don't, if they say, well, I have to go to the bathroom three times a night, then don't just say, oh, okay, it's just the bathroom. Ask them if they reach for their albuterol inhaler, either when they're headed to the bathroom or more likely when they're headed back. They've had a little trip. They're a little short of breath, so they use their inhaler. Don't forget obstructive sleep apnea is a comorbidity here and anxiety that can wake people up and even primary insomnia, they just can't sleep. So nighttime awakenings can't artificially lower that ACT score. Bronchodilator abuse can be from halt uh, habit, altered perception, vocal cord dysfunction, which is a problem in older individuals, uh, and then finally quality of life can be decreased because of their own lifestyle, because of their, they're lonely, they're unhappy, and so they see things in a very negative light. You can't just take the ACT score for what it is and suggest that unless they have an ACT score of 20 or better, that they're not well controlled. That may not be the case. They take more time, I think, is the bottom line. So the phenotypes persistent from childhood, late onset after the age of 65, and the, uh, the overlap uh, dominant versus asthma dominant uh, syndrome. Atopic versus non-atopic. Here's a very interesting thing. Now people are beginning to drill down. This is a paper published earlier this year, beginning to look for endotypes in these individuals for the elderly that may be unique. In particularly, uh, we think that the elderly, as we've discussed, have a less TH2 or T2 dominant. Uh, if you remember your immunology, IL-33 and 31 play a role in the pathway down that through the endothelium, uh, pushing the innate lymphoid cells and the uh, T cells down the TH2 pathways or not. Notice in this uh, slide 
the uh, on the left hand the EA stands for elderly asthma and the NEA is non elderly asthma and even though this looks like there's huge overlap they don't do in my view a very good job with this scale because it looks so compressed down but notice that there is a significant uh, decrease in the elderly asthma, both in terms of IL-33 production as well as IL-31 production. And you can see these other ones. There, there are other ones, but I won't uh, go into those for uh, uh, detail's sake. But these are the ones that are significantly different between the elderly and non-elderly elderly asthma populations. In contrast, if you look at this, looking at the eutaxin and TGF-beta levels, they are statistically uh, 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 elevated in the uh, severe elderly asthma, which is SEA, versus the non-severe elderly asthma. So these may be biomarkers that would predict or be associated with, which is a better way to say this at this point, associated with loss of control or poorly control or inadequately control, pick which term you like best, uh, in elderly asthma, something that we could be very useful with when we have trouble figuring out what other people and what these patients are actually trying to tell us. So in terms of management, again, control the inflammation, treat the bronchoconstriction, maximize quality of life, minimize adverse effects, side effects of therapy. That's true whether you're 2 or 102. It doesn't matter if you have asthma. Those are the goals. But in the elderly population, defining safe and effective management takes time and effort, treating the right disease because of phenotype heterogeneity, controlling the environment appropriately, socioeconomic issues and pharmacotherapeutic issues are even more important. It's not to suggest they're not important in pediatric and young adult populations, but they're more, even more important and play an even more central role in the elderly asthma population. Environmental control, again, uh, allergens versus pollutants, you're trying to control all of these things, toxic fumes, urban pollution, et cetera. It's difficult at times because of the expense of air quality improvement. Many of these patients live on fixed incomes, and to tell them to go out and buy a $400 air purifier is easy to say. It's very often hard for them to implement. Physical limitations for dust and mold control can be challenging. The commonality of indoor pets, again, for comments I made earlier, and then hygiene issues that can promote cockroaches, rodents, mold growth, and that hygiene issues is not squalor. That hygiene issue is maybe they don't clean uh, the food away as well as they do. Maybe the garbage stays in the garbage can or, 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 or the area inside the home a little bit longer because it's more difficult to drag it outside. Maybe the area around the garbage can outside is not quite as clean as it may have been 20 years before. That can have issues that can promote all of these uh, uh, antigens uh, from cockroaches, rodents, and mold growth. Socioeconomically, there's more isolation with aging. Their physical mobility, I should say our physical mobility limitations increase. Support structure can shrink with age. Uh, there are people that are not with us anymore in my age category that were with us just five years ago. And I celebrated last uh, summer, I celebrated my 50-year uh, high school reunion. And there are a lot of people that graduated with us that are not there anymore. This just happens. Outside interests tend to wane. This is particularly true in individuals who've retired. And when they retire and they're not particularly active and they sit at home and they watch the paint dry or they watch the grass grow, uh, they, this, this becomes very important to them because in many cases their economic challenges grow along with the decrease in their outside interest. Uh, physical comorbidities, the kyphosis and sternum convexity can increase AP diameter and decrease respiratory muscle strength. This happens as we get older. It happens in particular in women, but it can happen in both genders. Elasticity diminishes, which reduces our expiratory flow. Our sedentary lifestyle increases our physical deconditioning. And then psychologically, we have decreased cognitive abilities, which can minimize symptom recognition. We don't know that we're sick. This so-called paradox of well-being 
a higher level of life satisfaction with lower health expectations. And that's because we'll know somebody else that's in a nursing home. Or we'll know somebody else that's got a lot more physical infirmities than we do, and so we don't have the same expectations that we would have had when we were in our 30s. Anxiety and depression can alter concerns about addressing symptoms. It's almost the ostrich head in the sand attitude, and then disturbed sleep, which has an adverse impact on asthma control, whether it's a result of the asthma uh, uncontrolled or whether it is the initiator of disturbed sleep, which can re uh, result in fatigue, which can have an adverse effect on asthma control. Pharmacotherapy issues. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not to there. Here we go. Polypharmacy, cost is always an issue. Drug-drug or drug-disease interactions, distaste or concern about adding more medic medications to the regimen. Uh, never use two meds if one will do, but because they have all these comorbidities and in many cases all these specialists, the end result is that everybody has a prescription that they give to the patient, and that can be a real issue for them. The cognitive decline, remembering to take the right medicine at the right time in the right way, and poor recognition of adverse side effects. They don't know that the medicine is keep, keeping them awake. They don't know the medicine is making them more so peripheric, and so they figure the fact that they can't think as well is just part of getting older. It scares them, and they don't describe it to you. Physical limitations, coordination to use MDIs or sufficient respiratory efforts for dry powder inhalers, those are things that can be and must be evaluated consistently in the office to see that, and the candor with the patient is critically important. It does no good if it goes in their mouth. It's got to go into their lungs in the right concentration to be able to do the job, and their ability even to hold their breath for a sufficient period of time can be challenging. They can have issues related to dysphagia in pill swallowing. All of these are very important things. They may be more susceptible to the side effect at regular drug doses, and the anticholinergics may be effective for pure asthma in the elderly. That's very interesting, independent, again, of the COPD component. Now that we add uh, anticholinergics in even younger asthma that's more severe, I think we have more uh, experience with that, and we're not as afraid or reluctant to do that as maybe we might have been five or ten years ago. And the leukotriene modifiers, Again, even in more severe asthma, may be more useful in the older populations. These are small, uh, uh, hismanol is, uh, I'm sorry, Montelukast, say it right in a second. Montelukast is a much uh, smaller pill than some of the others. It's not all that hard to take, and it can be useful in these individuals that don't, particularly those that don't do a very good job with the, the regular inhaler technique. What about biologics? Uh, and we're almost done here, folks. We're in the home stretch. Studies for currently available biologics included uh, omelizumab reported to age 75, mepolizumab reported to age 68, and dupilumab reported to age 80. The theoretical limitations and possibilities, IgE decreases with age, so is omelizumab less effective, and maybe dupilumab because it's affecting IgE levels eventually. Eosinophils increase with age, but yet they have less specific activity per cell, and IL-4 increases with age. So when then, does that mean dupilumab would be better? Because even though the IgE goes down, the IL-4 goes up. Uh, this is a uh, paper uh, that was published earlier this year, uh, and it was from uh, uh, and it shows a very interesting picture here. If you look at this, these are the five currently available monoclonal antibodies for asthma. And then the, uh, going down the left-hand side of the slide and across the right-hand side of the slide, you have lung function, exacerbations, symptoms, and quality of life, side effects, and the quality of the evidence. Uh, the frowny face is suggesting that it is less uh, uh, effective in older compared to younger. So for omelizumab, while the effectiveness, this, the, the quality of data here is moderate uh, uh, to okay, uh, and they summarize some data to suggest that there may be more related to exacerbations with omelizumab in older compared to younger individual, but it has a similar, if not better, improvement in symptoms and quality of life as well as side effects compared to younger. If you look down the rest of these, uh, it, it, this means absence of data. 
there's really very little data in here. Benralizumab has some there, but even the quality of data there is just related to weaker data. This is to say that we need studies in older individuals that are intentional studies. A lot of the reasons for these little funny faces in here is that they derive these post hoc out of studies that have done where they have older individuals in it, but they did not focus on the older individuals. It did not ask questions particularly related to exacerbations and side effects that would have been more specific for the older individuals rather than the younger individuals. So much more work than this needs to be done. But this may be a useful thing just to give you an idea to be thinking about as we're relating uh, the use of biologics. The, critical, uh, the critically important statement here is that because somebody is 75 years old and has asthma, that being 75 does not a priori disqualify them from receiving a biologic. And that is probably the most impress, important message that I can give you about biologics itself. So finally, in the, in the final analysis here, this is the last slide, we have the presence of allergy and asthma is relatively common in elderly populations, much more so than it used to be. Diagnosis can be challenging, but must begin with the clinical suspicion. Management can also be challenging because of increased side effects, because of the issues related to polypharmacy, and because of the issues related to physical and psychological impairments. Reported morbidity, including emergency department visits and hospitalizations, is lower in the elderly individuals, but if they get there, their mortality is substantially higher. And then finally, we must address these patients in a fashion that recognizes common and unique situations to craft effective, personalized therapeutic programs for this part of our patient population. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And Paul, I'm not sure how much time we have, but I'd be happy to answer any questions.